Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I have two very special guests. I have Stacy Shackelford and I have uh, Doc Rush. Hey Doc Rush, how you doing? Hey Dennis. Good. Thanks for having us. Hey Stacy, how you doing? Hey Dennis. Awesome. Perfect. So obviously everybody knows Stacy. She was just on the last podcast, but uh, Doc Rush, if you wouldn't mind doing a real quick intro. Sure. Um, I'm a uh, citizen soldier, citizen airman. I'm a National Guardsman. And my uh, original career was as a radiation oncologist, specializing in the treatment of head and neck cancer and brain tumors. Also had a brief period where I was a surgical, general surgical intern in the 80s, and then an ER doc for two years before I went into radiation oncology. And then uh, in about 2008, at the age of 48, I swore in and joined the military to be the team doc for the 103rd Rescue Squadron, a PGA guard team in New York. And through a very, <laughs> the usual weird set of circumstances, I became the Air Force Pararescue Medical Director from 2012 to 2018, remain active on the TCCC committee and in support of uh, Jamie and the PFC team and uh, everything else I can do to help support the mission. Very good. So obviously, I think both of you are probably perfect guest for this uh, this particular podcast, and it's on triage. So as we're kind of morphing from, uh, you know, the Afghan-Iraq conflict into a giant question mark of uh, what the future conflict is, you know, the concept of triage keeps coming over, coming up over and over again. In, in various different aspects and how important this will be and for at least what we think about is the future fight. So I guess my first question is, what are we doing wrong? Sure. And for the, um, for the listeners, I want to emphasize that my bias is going to be towards the pre-hospital space. Uh, and I am not going to speak to the I'm going to speak at the medic level, not at the sort of role two doc level for now. So what are we doing wrong? The medics aren't doing anything wrong. Um, as you guys will see in a series of publications that will be coming out, we're going to try and change the way we think about how we do triage. So the systems of uh, Dime, ID, Me, Start, Mass, Salt, Jumpstart, all these uh algorithms and acronyms that have been created. Uh, it, it reminds me, and Colonel Shackelford will appreciate this, when I was a general surgical intern, my grandmother had a hiatal hernia, and we came in and the surgeon said, well, I'm going to pick this one of the eight hiatal hernia surgeries. I'm like, what the heck? And he's like, yeah, if we had one really good operation, we would have only one operation, but we don't have one really good one. So we have all these systems that have not been standardized. There's no universal approach to how we should do triage. So right away, that speaks to one of the issues with triage. The other uh, thing, the, the way I got into all this is, is while I was the PJ Med director, I debriefed as many missions as I could. And it was clear to me in the AARs that at least in the tactical setting, we were always prioritizing uh, safety and security. So if it wasn't a secure area, there was nothing fancy going on as it related to triage. And then a lot of the, the triage was really clinically based and intuitive, always based on pulse, respirations, and mental status, but nobody really using these complicated menus with arrows, you know, if breathing, yes or no, and then go to on to the next thing. Nobody used those things. The other thing we found in our uh, combat series, which I presented at SOMA and will be submitted for publication, is that in 30 operations ranging from, you know, like four to six casualties, multiple casualties to Cobar Towers with 520 casualties. There was, there were only two instances where people marked the patients. And that was, a, those were nighttime missions just with IR tags. They weren't marked for colors. People were uh, essentially uh, geographically triaged. So you put, you know, the real serious patients together and they'd be exfilled first unless there were different loading patterns of the ground vehicle or the rotary wing uh, 
vehicle for evac. So that's the second thing is that no colored tags were used. And then the final thing is all of the systems have four to five categories. In reality, people use three categories and that was essentially now, later or dead. And, uh, you know, we could say expectant or deceased. Um, but in most instances, especially where teammates were involved, there was no such thing as expectant. People tried to save everybody, but you would use uh, clinical judgment and maybe transport somebody who was more expectant than going to make it. You know, you transport them a little later and use some some uh, clinical judgment there or tactical judgment. But essentially, three categories were always used. Who needs to be exfilled now? Who, would, who could be exfilled later? And then uh, who was actually dead? And in the exfil later category, I think, this whole idea of having a green category or a real ambulatory category, minor concussion, cuts and scrapes, sprained ankle or whatever. People who could return to the fight are always being returned to the fight. On the civilian side, the people who could self-triage and go to the hospital on their own or going on their own. And really to break it up and complicate it by saying, well, we have a litter stable group of people, which is how I used to do it, and an ambulatory stable group of people. We just need to call them a stable group of people. And then the team leaders are going to determine the uh, load patterns in terms of how many stretchers and ambulatory we're getting into each bird or each vehicle. And uh, as we can talk about a little later in, in the details of the things that I've thought about, is that really just get everybody out of there as soon as you can. And some of it's just, you know, loading patterns and it might be tactical and not medical considerations. So we could get into that a little more. So the things I want to leave you with in response to what are we doing wrong, uh, it's the way we're training people, I think, that we're doing wrong. And it was nobody's fault. Everybody had the best of intentions by creating a sophisticated algorithm-based uh, kind of category system. So that, that would be my opening to that um, question, Dennis. Perfect. Um, so, uh, Stacy, kind of same question. So, it's the last podcast, uh, surgery for non-surgeons. You mentioned that, you know, very frequently downrange, you were receiving patients that didn't actually need surgery. So, again, you know, what are we doing wrong? Mm, I think we are uh, thinking on a small scale. We are thinking in terms of assessing individual patients and categorizing them. Uh, this approach goes back to uh, back to Napoleon's era and his uh, chief surgeon Loray. But um, we're not actually scaling our approach to you know to be to really large mass cal events, and we're not developing a different approach for events that are truly overwhelming. I think our experience has made us very good at responding to mass cal events in the range of you know, 20 casualties, maybe up to 50 casualties. But when you start getting into hundreds or thousands of casualties, uh, this approach of assessing individual patients, categorizing them as specifically into one of four categories, making this sort of I am God decision, you are expectant, uh, this is not going to work. And I think what we've really tried to do is frame this in terms of treating the population, uh, you know, sort of quantifying the scale of what we're talking about here, uh, adjust our goals accordingly. Uh, you know, when I, when I have 20 casualties, my goal is to find the sickest ones and treat them first so that you know so that they have the best chance of surviving and uh identifying everyone that can wait but my my goals are going to change if uh if my resources are just truly overwhelmed so uh so i think you know we don't really have uh experience with these large of events so what we've tried to do is look at the data we have from centcom in terms of you know, what injuries are killing people? What is the time to intervention that is, you know, that can save lives? And on the flip side of that, what is, you know, what is too long? And uh, people will die because they're not getting interventions quick enough. Um, it's really to a probably data-driven approach. 
And again, it is, you know, when we start talking about these really large scale events, it is somewhat theoretical, um, but I think we've really tried to simplify it and use uh, some driving principles, which we can talk about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, man, you know, and even I think what uh, you were talking about, uh, Doc Rush, when um, we were at SOMA, you know, a lot of this is on the purely medical side, you know, the confusion, I guess, of the different color tags and things like that, then none of that ever made sense to begin with. Um, but it's so ingrained though. It's amazing how like every, every type of uh, training event you go to every course, like those uh, four categories are really ingrained. You know, yeah. That's one of those things like it's kind of ingrained but nobody actually knows what the frick they're doing. Like they know the extremes of things, but once you get <laughs> to the, like the, the middle ground, um, it's kind of a crap shoot uh, who ends up in what. Um, but how do we kind of meld this? Cause you have the, the military aspect as well, right? Um, we have an operation going on. Uh, we have work that needs to be done. And now we have a casualty or we have, you know, hundred casualties so i mean i th i would think triage kind of has to kind of be somewhat inclusive of this military aspect as well you know kind of the life or limb type of um kind of issue like he's not gonna die but um i don't have the time nor the capability to hold on to this person you know, there, there's got to be some kind of aspect to that, I would imagine. Oh, I feel like what we've tried to do is really just uh, take out the individual decision making, you know, like assess individual patients and making a decision on individuals. We've tried to take that out of it to a good extent. And, um, you know, what we're really looking at is what we call first pass actions before you make your formal triage decision. And so, and it really depends on the time from the time of injury to the time that you're seeing the patient. So we know that first 30 minutes is really, really critical. Uh, that's the most important time where you need to stop external bleeding, clear the airway. Uh, the first hour is really essential in terms of, you know, moving the patient, getting them to a uh, surgical location. But if you can't respond within that first hour, there could be a million reasons why you can't. Maybe it's mission related. Maybe it's, you know, whatever the threat is ongoing. Uh, maybe it's just a really large scale event and you can't get the medics to the patients within the first hour. And so in that case, your response is really different. You know, all the people that are bleeding to death have already died. Uh, now your population is really, truly different. So, um, so really the first pass actions are really are what the biggest life threats are and uh we've known this for a while but bleeding to death that's number one so number one stop external bleeding and number two clear the airway make sure the patient can breathe you know it doesn't have to be an advanced airway intervention but if there's something uh if they need to be extricated from a you know a suffocating situation or pulled out from under something etc those are the two actions that you really need to take immediately uh as soon as you can you yeah, let me um expand on that a little it's uh it's sort of the direction we're going in for the medics i want you to think of uh four phases uh so to speak as colonel shackleford referred to the first is going to be the usual tc3 stuff stop the bleeding help stop the bleeding make them breathe and a lot of that is going to depend on the realities of the situation. If you are a medic embedded at an event that happens and you are magically spared, you will be able to put on tourniquets, pack wounds, and open airways. If you are a medic in a QRF or some other responding force that is getting there 30 to 90 minutes later or hours later for a plane that's shot down and there are survivors or whatever, uh, one of the things we've learned from the Alaska PJs who've been responding to plane crashes for about four four decades is that they don't even worry about the T, the first pass TC3 stuff. They're getting there one to four hours later, typically, 
and people who are going to die who needed a tourniquet or surgery will have died or they'll be in irreversible shock. And they're really just worrying about, you know, survival needs. So the way I want to break it down for the medics is I want them to think of four phases. The first phase, and we, we could come up with better nomenclature. Uh, we're just sort of making this stuff up now and, and trying to codify it. But the first phase is going to be uh, TC3 uh, MAR. So stopping the bleeding and opening the airway. The second phase will be the 30 to 60 minute phase of getting patients blood transfusions or surgery. So as Colonel Shackelford has uh, elegantly showed in the tr time and triage paper that's being published, that if you don't have a blood transfusion and you need it, you don't have it by 30 minutes, it's not gonna help you. And if you need surgery to stop the bleeding, it's unlikely to help you after 60 minutes. So that second phase is gonna be blood transfusion and surgery. The third phase, I'm gonna deem the secondary survey phase. Cleaning wounds, getting antibiotics on board, pain meds if you haven't already done that, and, uh, and some splinting, fracture stabilization, that sort of thing. But we've gotten past the lacerated iliac arteries and the pelvic fractures and the hemothoraxes that are gonna to bleed to death. And, and we can include chest tubes and things like that in that. But then the fourth phase is really comes out of my discussions with the FDNY. What do we do on Manhattan Island where we only have like six or eight points of egress and rotary wing is, is a waste of time when we have thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands casualties potentially from a, a, a nuclear explosion or something crazy like that. And then we're talking about survival needs, you know, shelter from uh, the elements, warmies, water and food. Plus, you know, I'm going to just say quite simply, uh, pill packs and um, stuff to clean wounds are going to be the, the last thing. And I get that also from Cobar Towers. And we could talk more about the difference between the Beirut bombings in the 80s and the Cobar Towers in the 90s and what we learned from that as far as what we need to do. So, But if we just sort of categorize those things into immediate action, you're a medic on scene and you happen to have survived, you know, and you're there to help, stop the bleeding, make them breathe then you're a responder or you're going to you're going to find those what is it going to be 5 10 20 patients you can actually operate on and get blood into uh, and then later on it's going to be the secondary survey stuff pause, what we call pause pain antibiotics wounds and splinting and then finally survival needs so i think if you start thinking about it and then this gets into what colonel shackelford's referring to in terms of scale if it's going to be a base you know with tens of thousands of people that really takes a hit with thousands, uh, you know, forget about going from dozens of casualties to a hundred or a couple of hundred, you know, God forbid we could be going to thousands and how are you going to think about it? And that's how I look at the Cobar Towers response over, you know, 24 to 48 hours. So just to break it down, that's the, the big thing I want the medics to walk away from this discussion as they start to think of SOPs and how they're going to plan for it. And of course, you know, the plan's going to change based on how fast can you get evac in, you know, and are you going from the middle of Asia to one of our uh, uh, role four hospitals, you know, uh, so those are, those are a couple of big picture things that go along with Colonel Shackelford's idea of let's change the way we think about it to thinking about scale, which is very different than some of your original questions about what do we do with the one or two or three people in terms of triaging them when it's a PFC thing and we have, you know, five days of ground evacuation in some other nation, you know, where people are really isolated. And I think that becomes a different discussion as it relates to uptraining medics to a more shock trauma role and less of a secondary, you know, shooter role and things like that. So it's a very wide ranging discussion. Your point about time is important. I will say because it really depends on the time that the first responder arrives. And so, for instance, that first phase of MAR really only applies during the first hour, it really less than the first hour, realistically, um, you know, really the first 15 minutes. Um, and so you're right, like, if you arrive an hour after the incident, when the injuries occurred, that phase one has already passed. And now you're really moving into, you know, into the second phase, which is uh, dealing with their uh, wounds, etc. 
Um, and then, yeah, just to talk about the scale of event, um, we thought about, a, you know, in terms of standardizing a terminology, three different size events being multiple casualties, mass cal and ultra mass cal. And we all know that the size of the event really is proportional to your resources and that determines your response. Uh, but just to have a way to think about it formally, if you have multiple casualties, and the reason this is important is because your goals really change depending on the size of the event. If you have multiple casualties, we talked about before, your goal is really to save everybody who has potentially survivable injuries as much as possible. And so in your triage process, you're really trying to identify those that are, uh, you know, those that require surgery or advanced life support interventions first and get those people treated while the other people can wait. Um, and then not to waste resources on the expectant patients, but really not to let any patients with potentially survivable injuries die. When you go to a larger scale event, for, uh, which we're calling MassCal, now, you know, just by the nature of the event, it's likely that it will take longer to get to the patients um, and your resources will be much more limited. And so in that case, you know, you really may need to conserve resources, which Literally in the last uh, 20 years in CENTCOM, we've really never been faced with this situation uh, hardly ever that we had to allow patients with potentially survivable injuries to die due to lack of resources just because we had so many resources. Um, and uh, we found that the two most um, high um, resource intensive interventions are blood transfusion and ventilator. And so for those patients who literally cannot live one hour without blood transfusion and ventilator support, those are your most resource intensive patients. And if you're really short on resources, uh, the thing you can do is not necessarily go around and declare people expectant, but just uh, not be aggressive about getting blood and ventilator support to those patients within the first hour. Uh, unless you've done everything else, unless all those patients have, you know, uh, had their airways cleared, external bleeding control, et cetera. Uh, but, but it's not the priority in the first hour because it's so resource intensive. And then we get onto the ultra mass cow. This is what Steve was talking about where the response is truly delayed. The only intervention that is likely to meet the timeline of life-saving interventions is TC3 from those people that are already on the scene. And I think that's important to emphasize because when we talk about, oh, it's a large, huge event, people are just gonna die, you know, can't do anything about it. I think the message should actually be, you know, we can do a lot, but it's all at the TC3 level and uh, that will save the most lives when getting people not only trained, but equipped with tourniquets, et cetera, um, will be the way to save lives in an ultra mass cal event. Uh, medical interventions are gonna be truly delayed. And, you know, those people that can't live uh, without a blood transfusion or ventilator are, are unlikely to survive at that point. So, I mean, all of that makes sense on a, especially on an academic level, you know, just us sitting around talking about it. How do I go about picking and choosing? Um, so I'll let Doc Rush have a chance because it looks like he wants to talk. Um, but how how do I face you know? Let's see, let's just even say like two dozen people because I mean if you're talking about thousands, like just give the drugs to yourself because you're going to need them. Um, but, uh, you know, a, even just a couple dozen, um, like, how do you, how do you s sift through all these people? Yeah. So I think, um, there are a couple of things and, and a lot of them go into preparation and rehearsal. 
The first thing is to psychologically prepare a 21-year-old new uh, 18 Delta PJ Corman that this is essentially an impossible situation that nobody gets correct all the time. And the bottom line is, let's just exaggerate it, one medic for two dozen patients, 24 patients. Everybody knows that when that one patient comes in a trauma bay or you have that one casualty, that takes up your whole bandwidth, right? So one thing that we've done in our exercises for the past six or seven years is I'll give a medic five to eight patients just as a practice thing and we'll line them up and literally, and, and let's just say that you have uh, battle buddies who are able to bring the patients to a medic centrally. And again, these are concepts, everything that Colonel Shackelford and I are talking about are concepts to give you principles from which to deviate in individual situations so that at least the medic has something in his or her mind. So what we do is we'll line up five to 10 patients or whatever the number is, and they'll go down each one and do M on each patient, then A, then R, then start lines, or give them pill packs, whatever we determine you know is feasible. So that's one way to do it is like, like Colonel Shackerford used the term first, first pass actions, just walk around. And if you see extremity hemorrhage that you could manage with a tourniquet, do it. Then if you see junctional wounds that you can manage with some wound packing, do it. You're not going to hold the three minutes of pressure, but that's where you might use a crew resource management, other people to help you. And you do each thing sequentially. And, you know, with the bleeding and the airway thing, we'll always remind people, Hey, one to 2% of these people are airway problems. The overwhelming number are bleeding problems, period, end of discussion. And we're not even worried about decompressing a chest until later on because of the 30 to 60 minutes it takes to create a tension pathophysiology or so. So that's one thing we do is we, we have a very specific exercise in a mass cow where we line up five to 10 patients with all the different injuries and we let them go. So like when they get to the TBI patient who's unresponsive, but they're not bleeding, they walk past them. You know, if they don't want to sit and deal with an NPA for trismus or, or crike, if they have other things to do. And, and you really have to mentally prepare young medics to just do their best. They're not going to be doing anything wrong because nobody knows how to do this absolutely correctly. And that's what I tried to show with the civilian literature review, which will be published in JSOM that we presented, which is number one, none of these systems are more than 50% accurate. That's number one. And number two, getting back to what you guys were talking about, which is the neuroses and psychoses with the colors and the categories, is that in training in civilian medics, about three quarters of people will try to use those systems. But in the real world, less than 20%, less than a fifth or so uh, actually use them. So we want people to have the freedom to maneuver and not feel hemmed into these things. You know, my bias is we need to stop teaching them. But the way to prepare people is to have these discussions, but then to do drills. And one of the ways to break it down is do M first, then A, then R, and do it in order, right? So the medic has a way that he or she thinks uh, and can go back to it. And I've seen experienced trauma surgeons say, hey, I'll step back when things are going bad and just start with them again, you know, and go through it methodically. And I mean, another way to emphasize what Steve is saying is that you really need to offload the decision making in the first, you know, in the first response. And if you're arriving at a scene within the first hour, you really just do two things. Uh, stop external bleeding and, you know, make sure they can breathe. And by clearing the airway, you know, it may just be putting them on their side or uh, getting them out of a burning, you know, uh, contained space, etc. Make sure they're not being crushed by something, if you can, if you're not wasting time, and do that as quickly as possible. And that way, you're really not making any decisions. Um, once you've done that with all the casualties, you know, now you can take a moment, take a deep breath and then try to figure out, okay, uh, do, do I have evacuation resources here? Can I get these patients with, you know, penetrating torso hemorrhage to a surgeon? Can I not, uh, maybe at that point I can do my formal triage, 
um, you know, where, where you're doing, you can, you, and by formal triage, you know, we put out, uh, unstable, stable ambulatory, um, as a, you know, as an option and we call it USA triage, but I don't care if you use dime or starch or whatever you do at that point, you, just, you know, once you've done the first pass actions, uh, then you do need to circle back, reassess all those patients, start move, you know, begin moving them, extricating them, whatever at that point. Yeah. I mean, I think the way Doc Rush kind of framed it before the dead, the not dying, uh, the potentially dying um, is probably, I think that's more reality than anything else. But what I guess I have a hard time uh, kind of framing in my mind is out of all this chaos, you know, we're just running around putting tourniquets on people, putting them on their side and kind of letting time to kind of triage things. How do I say this one person out of this giant pile of people needs to go to Stacy and it's worth sending in a helicopter in amongst you know this enormous threat of uh you know whatever it is um how do i determine that because i think ultimately this is why we're going through all these uh ridiculous uh training events on you know i'm gonna teach 18 deltas how to do how to be a surgeon we just need to figure out who actually needs the surgery to begin with. Okay, that's a great question. And this is really where, you know, one of my goals as the PJ Med Director was to put people's mind at ease. So there's a big difference between talking to a civilian paramedic who does that 40 hours a week and talking to an operator who has combat, tactical, intel, other duties or PJ's rescue besides the medical piece. You're not a full-time medical provider. So to answer your question, number one, you almost shouldn't be looking for that one person. You should be managing the problem. And let's just step back for a minute where Stacy and I have been focusing on stop the bleeding, make them breathe, get ready to leave, organize them, CCP, figure out the categories. There's a piece before that that we want to always emphasize to the medics is the tactical piece. So time and tactics almost always take precedence over medicine if the team leader says that's the case. So that if you're in a situation where you respond to um, a plane crash and there's jet fuel and there's a fire going on, you're actually going to move the people out of danger before you do medicine. If there is a remaining enemy threat, whether it's secondary devices, further indirect fire, um, or sniper or whatever it is, you're not doing medicine. You're addressing the threat. You're moving casualties to a CCP that's in a relatively safe location where you can move. So I still like to liken these things to the phases of TCCC. Is this a care under fire situation? Is there enemy threat? Is there literally fire and smoke? Is there other noxious fumes? Is it Syria with nerve gas? Is it something where we cannot stay put, stay in play? We need to prioritize casualty movement over casualty treatment. These are decisions that you guys are going to make intuitively if you have the right training. The other thing I like to say about the special operations community is you guys have already been selected, right? Which is very different than an 18 year old 68 whiskey who's a conventional guy without the same training and without the same selection. So you guys often intuitively know how to figure that out. Do I move the people first or do I treat them first? If that's something that we have to really be teaching you at some point, I think we've done it bad job. And I'm, when I say the Royal, we, the people have done assessment and selection, us training you guys as medics. So that's, that's the first thing. The tactics always have to be considered and we don't want that to get lost while Stacy and I are physicians and we focus on the medicine. I don't want that to be lost in this discussion. I want it to be emphasized to the operational medics that time and tactics often or almost always take priority over actually putting on a tourniquet or, you know, doing a cripe on somebody. That's number one. Number two, and this is my people who have listened to me before have heard me fetch. That's a Jewish word. Complain about this stuff forever. If we want to put on you guys to be really good at triage, we need to be mandating 
six to 12 weeks of hospital rotations a year. If you're not doing the primary surveys in a trauma bay of all the patients and then seeing what they look like and, and what their CAT scans and their ultrasounds and all that show and what, if, what you find in surgery, and you guys putting together the physical findings, the general appearance to what's actually going on inside the, the torso when the surgeons get in there, it's fantasy that you guys are going to be expert triagers looking for that one person out of 10 to 24 or two or three and prioritizing them. So let's just be clear about this. If we're just going to prioritize for the medics being on the range, not being doing clinical rotations and being awesome at physical diagnosis, I think we're kidding ourselves. So that's why I want to take the pressure off. And like Stacy says, take the cognitive bandwidth off these people if you don't have the experience of being in the hospital one or two months a year and seeing what these patients look like and who really looks bad and who doesn't, that's also what we showed with our literature review, that these systems are completely inaccurate at picking out who needs a critical intervention or who's going to die or who would benefit from surgery. So to me, you know, I'm just going to keep putting pressure on our community that if you're not putting people in the hospital every year or the trauma bay doing these rotations... The rest of it, I think, is like fantasy. We cannot teach you to do it. And that's why we have surgeons do five-year residencies so that they get pattern recognition and they see all the odd things and they know what they look like. And then they intuitively respond. When I listen to Stacy and Joe DeBose and Warren Dorlach and David King, all these people talk about what they do, it's all automatic response because they, you know, it's pattern recognition and they know what to do. They've done it a hundred times. So let's put that, you know, back in the equation. Uh, as far as being realistic. Important it is, it is, because we are literally putting other people's lives at risk to take this person away. How do we train that? I mean, what I think is important to, to um, it's not necessarily important for them to decide who needs surgery. Um, that's why I like the unstable, stable ambulatory categories. Um, and I like leaving out dead because I don't think that we need people to de make that decision that people are expectant or, or, um, you know, or they, they have unsurvivable injuries. I don't think that decision needs to be made. So I think really what they need to decide is if they have, un if they're unstable, that means their vital signs are abnormal, their radial pulse is weak, they, they lack a radial pulse, their breathing is in distress, or they have an altered mental status. Uh, those are basically, you know, the unstable patients. Um, if you want to throw in penetrating torso injury into that category, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with you. Um, and then stable, stable patient, you know, this would be one that can't walk out of there, uh, but is, you know, has a serious injury, maybe has a tourniquet on, et cetera, um, but is alert and has normal vital signs, palpable radio pulse. And so really, I think that's honestly the only decision that you need to make. And then, you know, if you're starting to really drill down and between the unstables, which one is more unstable or less unstable, you know, I don't think you need to make that call. Just get the first one that you can uh, with alter vital signs, alter mental status to the movement platform as soon as you can. And that's assuming that you're, you know, targeting that golden hour. This is all irrelevant when, if you're, you know, if your response time is delayed. Dennis, I have a, another, uh, another perspective from the operational side, and that is, I think it's the medic's job, and we're going to call, uh, you know, Army Medic, PJ, Corman, we'll just call medics for now. It's the medic's job to do what Colonel S said, which is, stable or unstable. It's the team leader's job to determine risk management. So if you have a young medic, if that person is acting like a controller and calling in air support, including evac, you know, something has gone horribly wrong. So my perspective in pararescue has been, and you, you correct me from the 18 Delta perspective, that the, the PJ medic's job is to say, this person's dying and needs a roll three or, you know, whatever it's going to be, or movement to a roll two with DCS or whatever the, the capability is. And it's the team leader's decision to take that risk management as 
you know, do we take the risk or do we not take the risk? And we all know, I could speak on behalf of Pedro, that though, once you tell those helicopters with the miniguns and the PJs in the back that we have somebody who's dying, and that was always the difference between Mert and Dustoff, is, you know, they would say that Mert would fly around, and if they heard gunfire, they would turn around and go home. Dustoff wouldn't even take off if they didn't have Apaches, but Pedro, I'll just speak on behalf of the Air Force, they will, if you ask them, and if there's not somebody like holding those guys down, they will launch for you. So once the team leader decides we want this guy out, you know, a tactical evac will come in. So I think that's a team leader responsibility, not the medic responsibility. Do you guys, and I need you to educate me here, is the 18 Delta often making that decision on evac risk, or do you guys have a team leader who's making that decision or an officer? Um, it's the team sergeant because like, you know, this guy has had, has had, uh, a decade of ex experience doing this job. Right. So, you know, from a Delta expect aspect, um, you know, I'm pushing up, you know, this guy needs to get out, but the team sergeant is the one who's looking at everything and like. Well, this is not a good tactical advantage to bring this helicopter in. We need to move or we need to do whatever it is. Um, and I mean, every situation is different, you know, and again, I would, I would tell that team sergeant, if it's been over an hour and the guy has already survived an hour, then, the, you know, the urgency of getting them out of there is vastly less than it is if, you know, if you've, if you've responded and, you know, the guy's bleeding to death and you, you still have a chance of saving him if he gets to a surgeon within an hour. So that timeline is so incredibly important and it should inform your right. decision making. But unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, he's depending on the medic to tell him the information because I will tell you, you know, from a medical aspect, the 18 Delta is essentially God telling the, the team sergeant that his echo or whatever will die if he doesn't get him out. And so he has to weigh that compared to the lives of the people on the evac platform to get this person out. And that's just, that's just current conflict, not to mention going forward where you are constantly, I mean, just looking at uh, the last podcast from the, uh, uh, the air doc from the Ukraine is like, you are running from artillery fire constantly. So I can't even, I can't even imagine that aspect right now. Yeah. I think, you know, I just think there's a lot to be said for the psychological preparation of new medics that you're going to be in difficult circumstances where you're going to lose people, you're not going to be able to save everybody. And I think that there is a benefit to preparing their minds by telling them that maybe, right, nobody gets enough training, but if you could do FMPs, full mission profiles, where you throw that in, like, like somebody says, I mean, in the guard, I don't even have enough access to my guys and we don't do enough training where we have people die on them just so we could get used to them. You lost this guy, right? So we can desensitize them to post-traumatic stress uh, from being a medical provider that you didn't save somebody's life or your buddy's life. And uh, I don't think we do enough of, you know, like, like I complained to the pararescue career field, we do a lot of rescue training, but we don't do a lot of recovery training. You know, the FEMA teams put cadavers in piles where they have the dogs find them. But we don't have enough people bagging cadavers into body bags and carrying them and feeling, you know, sort of how gruesome all that is. It really, you know, it's disgusting, essentially. And it's very traumatic to some young people, you know, even if they're cool operators. So I think everything that we can do to, you know, tabletop these things, even if you get something in their head, even if it's just a discussion, hey, you're going to be overwhelmed. Take a deep breath. ABCs, always be calm. You're going to get, you know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Keep going through those mantras, but letting them know that they're not failing. They're in a situation where people are going to die. You know, that's 
just how it goes. Like not every patient, even if the trauma surgeon stops the bleeding, a lot of those people are going to die of sepsis later, you know, or something like that. So it's, it's important for our health and well-being as medical providers to be prepared for that. And I think that's something that we could do a better job of across all of SOF, which is prepare for failure. And we don't do that enough. Right. Because SOF always wins. Um, like I said uh, a while ago, Stacy, you had mentioned that there was a lot of uh, guys coming in on EVAC that didn't actually need surgery, even though they were declared that they, that they were urgent surgical at the time. I guess, how do I, how do I determine that this person actually needs surgery? So they've survived the first hour. I've done hemorrhage control. I've done airway. Um, and we're just sifting through this giant pile of stuff. Um, who, actually need surgery um well the first thing i would say is i don't really see that as a problem so if they uh get designated as unstable because they have abnormal vital signs they need some type of advanced resuscitation whether or not it's you know surgery or whether it's uh just a chest tube um uh, an advanced airway blood transfusion everything in atls versus an actual uh, surgical intervention. I don't think it necessarily matters. Um, we are looking at, you know, can we put advanced resuscitation teams on the battlefield to help try to uh, stabilize patients or prolong the golden hour or that type of thing. But for the most part, um, especially when we're talking large scale events, uh, I don't really see that as a problem if they're designated as again, I don't really like the urgent surgical. What are the four categories? I don't even remember what they are, but um, we like, I don't even like those. <laughs> I mean, these categories are not really all that useful to reality. So I would rather, you know, instead of urgent surgical, I would just assume call it um, unstable and get that patient out of there, get them resuscitated, uh, you know, get them to a sur person, surgeon that can uh, do an x-ray, do an ultrasound, um, do a CAT scan, maybe depending on where they are and figure out what's wrong with that patient and then give them the treatment that they need. So um, I don't actually see that as a problem. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe in the future, could we try to be more granular and really be able to diagnose torso hemorrhage and chest hemorrhage, um, pelvic fractures, on the battlefield um i mean some things are kind of easy you can see them like uh high amputations or mangled extremities above the knee uh every single mangled extremity um amounts to at least nine units of blood transfusion you know so you're near massive transfusion right there so some of those just really bad extremity wounds they're easy to see for one and uh, they certainly require require a lot of uh, interventions, but I still think it just gets back to offloading the decision making, uh, you know, do the interventions, the simplest interventions that you can, don't expect to do more um, when you're truly overwhelmed. And then, you know, and then once you've done the you know, external hemorrhage control and airway uh, clearing, then, you know, then you can uh, take more time to reassess the patients and determine if there's more that you can do in that situation or how long is it going to be till you move the patients. Um, you know, you, you can uh, have more time to uh, make those type of decisions and there's not a single answer for every scenario. That's the ANS piece. That's why you get, you guys are specifically selected to be able to operate in ambiguity and uncertainty. That's why it keeps coming back to me. I love soft. I love conventional forces, but everybody has a different role. So at least within, you know, the PFC podcast for the soft community, part of that you're actually selected for. That's, that's what I keep coming back to. We cannot train for every imaginable circumstance. I think the beauty 
again, to sound like the self-licking ice cream cone of, you know, how much we love you guys. The beauty of ANS is that you have been chosen that we, we can't come up with every scenario and every permutation and every contingency. What we can do is give you basic principles, stop the bleeding, open the airway, move patients out of danger, eliminate the threat first. And then you guys have the DNA plus hopefully enough basic training, mastery of the basics that you can manage it. So I've gotten away from what you're asking, which is, can we prep for every contingency? That's the beauty of the tier one guys, right? That they have unlimited budget. They have no staff responsibilities and they, they train the bin Laden mission and come up with a week of rehearsals that have 87 different contingencies. When we did the Thai cave rescue, the beauty of what Derek Anderson and Charlie Hodges did was they literally sat down and started at the mouth of the cave and said, okay, walking in, what are the problems? Entanglement with electrical lines. The water is too murky. We can't see it. The child, we're swimming the kid out. The seal breaks. How are we going to, you know, what are contingency plans for if the seal breaks? And one of those was use oxygen, maximum oxygen in the tanks instead of air. So we supersaturate their brains so that if they're underwater eight minutes instead of four, maybe we'll buy a little more margin. So, you know, having those principles of mission planning, operations, and having that mindset or the DNA of being able to troubleshoot on the go, I think all those things together is what makes you guys unique and will continue to make you successful. So I have given up on trying to figure out what are all the things that could go wrong in a combat situation because I don't have experience. That's the team sergeant's job, right? In the end, you know, how am I going to handle all that? But that being said, we are asking for a little bit of a paradigm shift here. And so we do want to, I think the way to get after this is really actually with some tabletop exercises. So to summarize sort of the, the, um, really the, the paradigm changes, um, you know, classifying the scale of mass cow, the timeline of life-saving interventions, uh, first pass actions prior to formal triage, uh, simplifying the actual triage decisions, and then that sort of concept of uh, ultra mass cow is really primarily casualty movement and survival needs. And so those are really the, you know, the new concepts that we're really trying to emphasize. And I think, I do think the way to get after it is just to, you know, just to, to teach this through a series of tabletop exercises, um, get it out there, get these concepts into, into the, into the curriculum. And like Steve said, once you've kind of um, thought through these concepts, you know, really, it's yeah, really actually I think you're right. a, simple, I mean, a simple thing to uh, do yeah. because uh, it offloads yes, a lot of your decision I don't even know what to say. Um, it's one of those. It it's is, overwhelming. It There's is no completely question. overwhelming. Um, and it's, it's horrifying. You know, we're talking about like ultra mass cow. We're talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, essentially, you know, a disaster, right. but within the realm of what you could control, we want to give the medics these tools to manage two, three, four dozen casualties by themselves. Right. Um, cause I mean, you know, the way we're training right now, you know, it's such, it seems like it's such finite detail. When actually we should be, we should be looking, um, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, man, oh man. Uh, looking at the population, you know, you're just nailing like guys you said, on you know, like, instead of focusing so the, much in on minutia, each individual patient, you know, after talking with, to, with to all you that guys, uh, detail. like, we need to be broadening this out uh, to such a, to, to uh, I mean, dozens. I can't, that's even a small population. You know what I mean? Especially if they're, if they're talking about these ultra mass gals where you're looking at, you know, thousands of people. 
I can't even imagine you putting eyes on that many patients. No, you don't. You're, you're uh, not. The that's, people on that's the scene whole point. are literally the only people that are going to help the patients uh, within the first hour. Right. And, it's, and essentially, you're using time to kind of triage. Because that's, I mean, talking about, let's just say 100 patients. It's going to be an hour before you circle around, back around to get to the first guy that you just saw. And you put, you know, a tourniquet on and you rolled them on the side. And that's, that's if they're, that's if they're actually next to each other. So we, we do a lot of plane crash training with debris fields. And I, you know, I always stick a couple of people in the bushes because they got to search and have accountability, right? So accountability is another tactical piece that we haven't even gotten into in this discussion. But I think what, you know, that we want to leave you guys with are these overarching principles that Colonel Shackelford just mentioned. And I think those should be the, you know, those should be the four or five pillars of how we go forward and teach and, and then run exercise. You know, I just, I just want to get my head wrapped around, you know, this constant concept of triage in such a, a, such a dynamic and incredibly difficult environment. Um, and really, like always, it comes down to, you know, basics, hemorrhage control, airway management, you know, if necessary, you know, dealing with the chest. But, you know, essentially time is the big triage decision maker. Um, and then it's kind of like a nicety on top of things if you're able to get somebody out choose choose wisely who gets to go to the surgeon because it's going to be like a very few yeah and i think it's really important again when we train young operators that these are not perfect decisions and again if you're not putting people in hospitals mm -hmm. they are not intuitively going to know stable and unstable but if they still rely on pulse breathing and mental status they won't go wrong and I think you just reinforce that it's impossible to make, that people are going to die. It's impossible to make exact decisions until you almost open the patient sometimes, uh, let alone CAT scan and ultrasound in experienced hands. And just, I think a lot of this is really preparing the medics so that they don't get PTSD from this stuff, that they know they did a good job and there's mm -hmm. no such thing as a perfect job. And if we're not sticking you in hospitals one or two months a year to think that you're going to magically go through a dozen or a couple of dozen patients and pick out the worst ones is fantasy. We're doing the medics a disservice, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Let alone the patients. Absolutely. That's a separate discussion. Oh, yeah. 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 Cool. Um, to be honest, I think I'm good at the moment. Um, as depressing as this is, um, Oh, uh, Stacy, do you have anything to leave us off with? Uh, keep it simple. That's all I like to say. Yep. Duck rush. Keep it simple. Internalize some of these basic principles. You will do a good job and feel good about what you're doing. So if you're prepared, you've rehearsed and you stick to the basic principles and then deviate as needed you will be an awesome medic. Sounds perfect to me. All right. Thank you very much, both of you. Right on. Dennis, I hope we didn't freak you out. That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Our boy is waiting there for you